What's shaking, everyone? So the University of Pennsylvania just did a thorough analysis on Joe Biden's new tax plan that he'd like to introduce in 2021 if hell, in fact, does freeze over and he is elected in, in November. But there are some good things to be had in this. It's going to cost a ton of money and it's going to take a ton of money as well. And so we're going to go through this, hit a bunch of the highlights. I've got a couple of... Ah, suggestions to make it a little bit more palatable for the people if this old ghoul in fact does get elected as well as take a look at someone else's opinion and I noticed something that's eerily similar to something that happened in the past 50 years as well so before we get started if you guys appreciate the work that I do here if you like my analysis I would really appreciate you hitting that sub button as well as hey you like the video itself just hitting that thumbs up button for a like there does you absolutely no disservice but it does me a ton of good so let's just go ahead and dig right into this so right ahead it's the Penn Wharton budget model division of the University of Pennsylvania as far as I can tell it's kind of their business schooly sort of division and what they found we'll just quickly read the summary Presidential candidate Joe Biden's campaign has released a substantial list of policy proposal proposals. PWBM finds that over the 10-year window of 21 through 30, the Biden platform would raise 3.375 trillion in tax revenue and an increase in spending of 3.37 trillion. Now, I did go to college. I did graduate high school with very high percentile and I don't need a calculus degree to figure out that 5.37 trillion dollars in new spending is not offset by 3.375 trillion dollars in new tax revenue I don't know about you but it uh, the numbers don't match up but in the good news Almost 80% of those increases in taxes under the Biden plan would fall on the top 1% of income distribution. And this is the first point of contention. This is the first little bit of opinion we're going to get here. I really hate when people want to take money from the rich and the successful. What it does is, in my opinion, it disincentivizes it disincentivizes achievement. It disincentivizes success. Like once you hit a certain threshold, you're going to get taxed more. Obviously, I'm not talking to school children here. You guys do understand this. And I can give you a first-hand account of this. My thought, I come from a you know, lower middle class background. Uh, we're doing significantly better now and same with myself. I've you know, done saving and never have made more than what thirty five, forty thousand dollars a year, and I've still managed to save away. But my father does considerably better, and he's always in that little gray area in Canadian tax brackets where if he does even just a little bit better the next year, he immediately jumps up the tax bracket tax bracket and whatever work he did in that year is going to be for naught because it's going to get forfeited to you know the tax and spend liberals or the NDP party in stupid Alberta briefly hopefully never again but what that does is you know you look at it and it's like I can work those extra hours I can work that overtime but I'm not going to see anything from it. I'm immediately just going to get bumped up a tax bracket. And I'm sure this isn't a unique scenario for people out there. There's people at the non-taxed that go up to the taxed bracket slightly who see that same kind of play there and, you know, feel disenfranchised from it. So I just don't like whenever people advocate for taxing the millionaires and the billionaires Bernie Sanders and you know when people have the ability to keep their money instead of relying on the government to give them back their money that they already spent like 
just let people keep their money and let them decide what to do with it. But I suppose that's my libertarian and right leanings coming out. But let's get back to the main point. That's just hot take number one. Hot. Yeah, obviously. Over fiscal years 21 through 30, the Biden platform would raise. We already went through that. Under the Biden tax plan, households with adjusted gross income, AGI, of $400,000 per year or less would not see their taxes increase directly, but would see lower investment returns and wages as a result of corporate tax increases. Those with AGI at or below 400000 would see an average decrease in after-tax income of, point na- of essentially 1%. Under the Biden tax plan, compared to a decrease of 17.7% of those AGI above $400,000. We're going to dig into the raw numbers here in a little bit, but we'll just finish up with the key points. The largest areas of new net spending are education at $1.9 trillion over 10 years, and infrastructure and research and development at $1.6 trillion over 10 years. It's weird to be talking in trillions of dollars just wow that's a unquantifiable amount of money in total including microeconomic and oh sorry including macroeconomic and health effects the biden platform increases federal debt by 0.1 percent in 2030 by decreasing before debt by 1.9 percent in 2040 and 6.1% in 2050. GDP decreases, not good, by 0.4% in 2030, sees no change in 2040, and an increase of 0.8% in 2050. I will be 60 years old at that point. (laughs) Hopefully close to retirement at that point. And a good thing um yeah good thing good old biden is looking after uh us senior citizens in the future anyways i want to go down to the raw numbers of what the breakdown actually looks like so this is what raw income tax payroll tax taxes in general are going to look like for people at different tax brackets so in 21 what it has here is uh the TCJA is the executive order that Trump passed a few years ago now at this point that dramatically slashed uh, income tax and taxes of all sorts. And what it doesn't exactly paint a rosy picture. And the fact that it said that 80% of all of that new 3.375 new money raised from taxes is... 80% of it is coming from the highest top 1%. Well, everybody has a tax increase. It's nominal for some people. But, hey, let's just take a look right at it. So the bottom quintile, obviously, uh, they aren't making anything. So, as you see here, it's, it's negligible. It's half a percent. And then you see the... About the same thing there. And it all just breaks down to be relatively the same until you hit about the top five percent okay and then you start having the 0.6 percent and then a full percent higher than that and then it totally explodes if you are one of the fortunate people out there that almost make a million dollars per year and then yeah it just goes absolutely bonkers after that like i stated previously I'm not a big fan of, you know, taxing the shit out of the people and disincentivizing them from succeeding. So after looking at boring raw numbers, we're going to take a look at the big areas, the three that were originally mentioned in the opening statements there. So the huge part of the Build Back Better, the Made in America plan that Joe Biden's putting forward is... The $1.9 trillion over 10 years, over 10 years, not immediately, in public infrastructure, in the public sector. And we'll just go ahead and read this right here. Biden calls for new large public investments in each 
of his platforms for clean energy, his Made in America plan, and education encompassing preschool, elementary, and post-secondary education. PWBM's analysis group groups those investments into three major categories, education, infrastructure, and R&D. So what he's proposing with his tax plan is universal pre-K, expanded funding for Title I schools, two years of debtless college university universally available, and free public college for students from low-income families. <sighs> Man. Okay. I didn't go to pre-K. I don't know many people who did go to pre-K. I think that's a waste of time and to get a little bit more conspiratorial and kind of, you know, lean into some of my conservative proclivities. Uh, just seems like they want more time to indoctrinate your kids while they're young to push their liberal agenda. But whatever. If it's taking over for people who need the daycare, then... I suppose if you're going to divert funds, which this analysis doesn't look at, but if you're diverting funds from childcare and putting it into the universal pre-K, whatever. But the other thing that sticks out like a stiff prick in a whorehouse is two years of debtless college universally available. That's just more time to indoctrinate. I... You give people something for free and they aren't going to appreciate it as much as something that they work for. Okay, I know it took me... I was out of high school before I went back to college to get my personal training degree. That was... The idea to become a personal trainer never crossed my mind one bit. In, geez, at least two years, probably about two and a half years. And if I would have had free college at my disposal, I probably just would have wasted my time. Okay, there's a lot of people that just take college for you know, a year or a semester and are just going to take general studies so I can figure out what I'm going to do. And all that's going to do is waste money. That's my opinion, though. You, If you have a different opinion, please drop it in the comments. I'm definitely open for conversation on this. So his infrastructure plan is not all that terrible. Water infrastructure, obviously larger cities are going to need new water and wastewater treatment plants and infrastructure itself. I totally agree. High speed rail. Uh, sounds like Mondale's monorail. I don't like it. Municipal transit. Okay, if you have to replace some transit buses, I understand. And the rest of it's just green shit, which um, I don't know, man. It's probably the way of the future, but there are other green alternatives available. So housing is the last big one that I want to touch on. Okay. So Biden has committed a total of $650 billion in new housing spending over 10 years. This plan includes providing Section 8 housing to all who qualify, expanding the low income housing tax credit, Creating new incentives to build affordable housing, including a new affordable housing fund and other programs to support low-income housing. Three of those points there I don't necessarily disagree with. But there is one that I would like to change, and I mentioned this in my intro. Instead of building and providing more Section 8 housing, try Section 5. A lot of people have not heard about Section 5 housing. Now, Section 8 housing provides rent support. And what that is, is that's a standard democratic tactic to create more dependency. What Section 5 is, is that same government-funded housing, but it provides a path to home ownership. And like I originally stated a couple points ago, when you own something, you have personal responsibility over it. You have a vested interest in making it a better place. Now, if you turn those Section 8 homes into houses that people can buy at a reduced price, I'm totally on board with that. But that's not what this program and that's not what this plan is for. What it is is to create more dependence and ensure that the populace continues and has their, well has democratic 
propaganda expanded even further. But I don't want to get too off in left field, but that's the breakdown. Those are the raw numbers. If you guys would like to read through the rest of this tax plan, it's a bit of a dry read, but it'll be linked in the description as always. So let's just go ahead and hop into what Fox had to say. This is where I originally learned about what was going on. So we'll just dig right in. Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden has laid out a multi-trillion dollar spending plan that would raise taxes by $3.4 trillion on mostly wealthy Americans and everybody else, as we've seen earlier, and corporations over the next decade, according to an analysis released Monday. The former vice president's campaign platform would raise federal spending by about $5.4 trillion, roughly 24% of gross domestic product by 2030, according to new findings by the Penn Wharton Budget Model, a nonpartisan group at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. Wharton Business School. Yeah, that's why it sounded familiar. I mean, yeah, that's, an, that's another thing too, a nonpartisan group, and they've done some great research in the past as well. The spending, pan, the spending plan, which is more than double what Hillary Clinton proposed during the 2016 campaign. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Man, what a difference four years makes, too. Would be funded by a slew of new taxes, including a corporate tax hike. An insane corporate tax hike, which Wharton said would... Well... It would be felt at every level of the tax bracket, not just at the corporate tax level. You know, when you increase taxes on corporations, uh, Nick DiPaolo had a great quote on this. And um, when was the last time a fucking poor person ever got a job from... When was the last time you ever got a fucking job from a poor person? Yeah, exactly. So you start kneecapping these corporations who employ hundreds if not thousands of people at some levels like you can argue if it's a great living or if it's a path to suck or path to success but immediately immediately if you start handicapping people uh a bunch of those benefits and a bunch of those you know what seems like crazy ideas right now like a four-hour work week becomes less and less likely because there's not enough money to go around okay anyways Biden's trillion dollar proposal signaled that he will continue an unprecedented level of government spending that began in mid-March as an American life came to a grinding halt because of the COVID-19 crisis that continues to this fucking day for some goddamn reason. Anyways, Biden has pledged a high corporate tax rate on day one, right? Listen, look, of his presidency, if he wins the November 3rd election, increasing the tax rate from 28 from 21 where it is right now. That would generate more than $1.4 trillion unless these corporations just can't make the money because you are hiking the taxes so much. Seven points is a significant amount. In addition, Biden says that he plans to reverse changes made to an individual income rates for households earning more than $400,000 under the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act. That was the executive order that I referenced when we were looking at the tax, at the tax spreadsheet there. By repealing those changes, the top income tax bracket would revert to 39.6% from 37%, raising an estimated nine or $944 billion. This is a bonkers. It just goes through a bunch of more raw data here. But there's one... This is where I had the epiphany. Okay? Let's listen to this. According to Wharton... Biden's spending proposal would cause the biggest federal budget increase in half a century since Democratic presidential nominee George McGovern in 1972 ran on a platform that included a guaranteed minimum income for all Americans. That's not the point. 1972, George McGovern ran. Who did he run against? He ran against Richard Nixon. And was that when Richard Nixon was originally elected? No, in fact, it was Nixon's re-election campaign against a milk toast kind of radical spender. And uh, how did that work out for George McGovern? In a 49-state landslide, 
the first time that ever happened. And then Walter Mondale, not but 12 years later, received a similar fate. So I tell you, man, the fact that the first time in over, well, 50 years, Biden's putting forth the same type of spending program. Obviously, Wharton, Wharton analyzed it to be as such, and well, Fox reverberated what I was thinking. And immediately, yeah, the George McGovern comparison is right there. Now, we look at the map, obviously, it would take a miracle for Trump to flip California and New York. I don't think we're ever going to see a 49-state landslide in either direction ever again. Man, I'll tell you what, though. I think a landslide nowadays probably would be 40 states. I don't think I'm stepping too far out of bounds because who's given any kind of credence to most of these polls that are out there right now? They were so wildly off in 2016, and they're still trying to pass the same information in 2020. So I'm not biting. I'm thinking that this map is going to look a little bit closer to what we're going to be seeing in, well, hopefully we'll be seeing in November. Anyways, guys, thanks for taking the time to watch this video. It's a very important thing to look over. It's a kind of a dry subject, so hopefully I made it a little bit more palatable for you. That'll do it for this video, and I'll catch you in the next one. I've been Don Consuelo, and I want you guys to follow your gut and get after it. Take care, everyone.